led to unprecedented policy intervention from the Federal Reserve uh, in March 2020 that uh, Alan discussed in his paper yesterday. And that helped mitigate significantly the outflows from mutual funds as well as the drop in prices. And just so we're on the same page, I plotted here the change in bond prices during spring 2020. So you can see how the market was sort of unraveling for bonds, both IG investment grade and high yield. And once the policy uh, announcement happened, the bond price drop sort of uh, reversed. And at the same time, you see significant outflows from mutual funds that were also mitigated by the policy announcement. So teasing apart this uh, non-bank fragility is challenging because the flows and asset price movements are jointly determined in equilibrium. So in this paper, um, this, in this interaction is a key driver of market fluctuations, particularly in times of crisis. So in this paper, what we're going to do is ask the question, how can we quantify these equilibrium effects, disentangle them, and think about assessing policy interventions in times of crisis. Specifically, we're going to extend the demand-based asset pricing model that Ralph and Moto have developed and endogenize the distribution of wealth across funds. And so we're going to use a household portfolio choice to do this. Uh, and this is going to create our, the key mechanism in our model, which is a two-layer demand system which is going to be driven in the first layer by a flow to performance relationship where households are choosing funds, and then an inelastic asset demand when uh, institutions and funds are choosing assets. So a preview of our key results, we're going to find in our model this dynamic amplification where asset prices, when they drop, that's going to lead to outflows from certain funds and that's going to amplify price drops further. We're also going to show evidence of contagion, where even if the shock is initially started only in one asset class, it can spread to other asset classes and across uh, institutions. Our model is also going to yield some fragility measures where we're going to be able to quantify how different assets have a, an, a bigger effect on the overall market, given uh, the distribution of what kinds of funds hold them. And finally, we're going to be able to evaluate different policy responses to crises that affect the corporate bond market, such as asset purchases and conventional monetary policy. Our paper is going to contribute to three strands of the literature. We're contributing to this literature on, on asset uh, demand system, asset pricing. There are many people in the audience who worked on this. So this is uh, Ralph and Moto's work. Uh, and also Lorenzo and Lucas, I, I think we're in the audience, by endogenizing the dynamics of how the wealth distribution of funds is determined. Second, we're going to contribute to this literature on non-bank intermediaries by thinking more about how institutions demand for the um, inelastic demand for assets is going to affect their fragility. And finally, we're going to contribute to this uh, literature on the role of uh, financial intermediaries in crises by focusing on those unlevered uh, intermediaries like mutual funds. So I'm going to start with a theoretical framework. I'll talk about estimation and I'll end with a crisis and policy counterfactuals. So the first layer of the theoretical framework starts, uh, the first layer is essentially going to determine how the uh, fund wealth is distributed, starting with households who have some exogenous wealth that choose the institutions to put their money in based on characteristics X, that include, importantly, past returns, but also other fund characteristics. Then I can write down a nice closed form logit expression for the weight of each institution I's liabilities in the household H's portfolio. I can then write down an expression for how much that each household demands in shares of the liability in terms of the quantity of shares by adjusting with the household's wealth and the price per share. The second layer is going to look very similar, but the second layer is going to determine how funds make their portfolio decisions. So institutions uh, are going to choose assets to maximize their indirect utility based on characteristics of the assets, including price and other non-price characteristics. 
This is going to, uh, again, give us a closed form expression for the weight that each asset has in each institution's portfolio, which then, again, aggregates into the number of total bonds that each institution demands based on the uh, wealth of the fund and the price of each asset. So these are the two layers. And to clear the market, we first have to clear institutional liabilities so that the total supply of institutional liabilities have to equal the demand that households have. And the markets for the assets also clear where the total supply of given assets are going to equal the demand across all institutions. Here we're going to have zero uh, net issuance, but we can easily extend the model to include issuance if we want. So we're going to uh, characterize equilibrium dynamics in a nice closed form way by making two key transformations. If you're interested, the derivations are in the paper. But essentially what we're going to do is think about aggregating up the flows and prices into matrix form where we have a vector of flows for each fund, and then we have a vector of prices for each asset. And we're going to look at things in terms of changes. So we want to look at dynamics. So we're going to look at how prices change from T period T minus one to T. And so this allows us to write down in matrix form the two key dynamics of an equilibrium of the model, which is first, how do changes in prices across all assets in the previous period affect flows into and out of institutions in this period and then in turn how do flows in this period affect prices in this period okay so how first how do changes in prices last period affect flows in this period well that's the matrix phi which is going to aggregate the flow to performance sensitivities what we call beta across all funds and it's going to be weighted by how much each asset is in uh, the portfolio of each of the funds. And so we're essentially aggregating up how much changes in prices across all assets affect the flows of each individual fund. Next, how do flows affect prices? That's going to be this matrix psi, which is essentially a price impact matrix. And it's going to first aggregate across for each asset uh, who holds, what funds are holding that asset, what are the holding shares of that uh, bond, times this sort of price impact, which is the inverse demand elasticity, as price impact is always the inverse demand elasticity. And you can think of the demand elasticities as being the own price elasticity, how much I change my demand for bond B when bond B price changes, and the cross price elasticity, how much do I change my demand for bond B when bond A price changes. So this is going to be my price impact matrix. And these two equations are going to be the core of uh, how uh, shocks and policy changes affect our, um, the prices and fund values in our model. So the model is going to yield dynamics of both amplification and contagion. So to show this more concretely, I can write down an expression for the aggregate amplification and contagion. First, by saying, suppose there's some exogenous impact in asset prices, let's call it V. How does it affect things in equilibrium in the long run? So if we go back to our equations from before, if V is a change in price, first it's going to affect flows by phi, then it's gonna affect prices in this period by psi. So I just multiply by phi and psi, right? So I have the second round impact on prices is just psi times phi times V. Then I can accumulate all of the effects in the next periods into a nice geometric series that has a closed form expression that basically represents the full amplification and contagion effect of a given price shock V. What's nice is then that, that gives us a, uh, an expression for what we call asset fragility. So given a price shock to a given asset, what's the effect on the overall uh, the aggregate market? So what's a 1% drop in one bond value going to affect the aggregate market? And so we have this, this core expression that I derived here. We're going to weight it by the market share of each asset relative to the whole market. So you can think of this as saying, if there's no amplification and contagion and this expression is, this, this internal expression is one, then the asset fragility is just one. That's just a normalization. So we're gonna come back to this once we do the estimation. 
But first, let me demonstrate what the model does in dynamics. So we have an initial shock here, say it's a 10% shock to high yield bonds only. So on the left hand side, I plot the dynamics of bond prices from period one, which is when the shock happens, to period 10. And so the first thing you can see in pink, where I have high yield bond prices, is that there's an amplification effect. So the initial shock is negative 10%, but you can see the price continues to drop. Why? Because the mutual funds that hold the high yield bonds, they experience a negative return in period one when there's a fundamental price shock. But then because of the negative return and because the households that invest in that institution now see a negative return and they want to take their, uh, they want to redeem their shares of that mutual fund, then the mutual fund has to sell more high yield bonds. And that's going to reduce the price further. That's where the amplification comes from. Moreover, there's going to be a contagion effect because these mutual funds don't just hold high yield bonds, they also hold an investment grade bond that they like to hold in, in a fixed proportion. So they're going to also sell some investment grade bonds, which is going to affect the investment grade bond prices. So that's the cross asset contagion. And because insurance companies primarily hold investment grade bonds, then you also get a cross institution contagion. So to demonstrate why the first layer of the demand system is important, if we shut down that first layer, essentially just set the beta to zero, then we see the drop in prices and we don't see uh, any dynamic amplification or uh, contagion effects across assets or across institutions. Okay, so that's the model. So let's get to estimation. So we're going to layer, uh, we're going to do it by two layers. So the first layer is we're going to estimate the mutual fund flow sensitivities using CRISP and Morningstar data. So we can just look at a uh, panel of flows and returns. How does the flow in one period uh, change relative to the returns from the previous period? And then the second layer, we're going to estimate demand elasticities using a method similar to what uh, Ralph and Moto do, and also what uh, Lucas and uh, co-authors do um, using holdings data uh, and instrumenting for price using the uh, wealth of investors that have that bond class in their investment universe in that period. Okay, so a summary of our estimates here from 2010 to 2019 is the price elasticities are, are in the order of one, insurers have lower elasticities than mutual funds. And then the betas, we're going to set insurer beta to zero, and then the, uh, the betas for mutual funds are in the sort of 0.5 to uh, 0.9 range. Okay, so we can use these estimates to quantify asset fragility, where we have an impact, again, of 1% drop in bond value on aggregate market. And so you can see, um, if we just look at four different asset classes, high yield bonds are more fragile than investment grade, and short term bonds are more fragile than long term bonds. And importantly, investment grade short term bonds are also high, highly fragile, primarily driven by the fact that they have a high share of a sort of flighty mutual funds that hold them. Great. Okay, so now that we have the model and estimation, we can add a crisis. So this is the exciting part, and then we can think about policy. So we're going to calibrate. Uh, for now to the spring 2020 crisis by first feeding in fundamental shocks that are implied by CDS. We're just going to look at the first 10 days of CDS shocks. And then we're going to use estimates of our elasticities and sensitivities from the end of 2019, as well as the wealth and uh, asset distribution from the end of 2019. We're going to add an additional level of heterogeneity, which is that asset demand might be sensitive to flows differentially. And so we're going to calibrate the sensitivity to outflows in order to match the data. What are we trying to match? We're going to match first the total bond price decline and in, in investment grade uh, pre-policy intervention, which was 20%, as well as the 10% drop in mutual fund flows pre-announcement. Uh, pre and we're going to um, match that investment grade bonds are sold first, which was documented in Kairong's paper with Yiming and, and Yao. We're able to uh, very closely match the dynamics of prices and fund flows uh, during this crisis, sort of pre the policy. So this is obviously we're not including the policy intervention here, but now we can think about different kinds of policy intervention. So we can start with, say you have conventional monetary policy and you can put in a hundred basis point uh, rate cut. 
And in our model, we can sort of test how timing matters. So on the left hand side, I'm going to look at the dynamics of asset prices, both investment grade and high yield. On the right hand side, I'm going to look at the dynamics of, of fund values, assets under management, uh, both for um, insurance companies and for mutual funds. The top panel is going to look at intervening at the time that the Fed actually intervened, which is about 14 days after the onset of, of the crisis. Uh, and the bottom panel looks at intervening really, really fast, sort of in the second day of when fundamental shocks, shocks start happening. So you can see here that the rate cut is going to have broad effects. It's going to have a stronger effect for longer duration assets, just by definition of a rate cut. And so because investment grade are longer duration, that's going to have a much bigger impact here. And you can see in the short term, there is some benefit to uh, intervening early, but the ultimate steady state values don't change significantly based on the timing of the policy. So next we can look at uh, asset purchases. So this is closest to what the Federal Reserve actually did. So they, um, here we're looking at buying, the central bank bought 5% of short-term IG bonds, so short-term meaning less than five years. And so this is uh, on the order of magnitude of what they said that they would potentially do. And so again, these are the same four plots. And you can see this is a smaller rebound, partially because the short-term IG sector is not that large, and you're only targeting them. You're not targeting the entire market. And the timing here matters little for the eventual rebound. So there's maybe less pain in the short term, but in the end, you end up with similar prices and fund values. So next, so this is closest to what the Federal Reserve actually did in, in terms of announcement. Uh, next, we can look at sort of more counterfactual policies. And um, the first one we think about is if, we, if the central bank were to open direct lending, collateralized lending to the non-bank intermediary sector. So the Federal Reserve did not do this, but this has been pr proposed and analyzed at the ECB, for example, which is suppose the, the funds, just the mutual funds here, are able to borrow from the Fed directly uh, to the amount of 2% of their investment grade assets. So depending on how much they hold, that's how much they can, they can borrow. And here, intervening early is a lot more effective because what happens is the outflows are directly counteracted by the lending. If you do it early, you're going to reduce a lot of that painful price drop and fund outflow contagion effect. So here, the timing actually matters significantly. So it's uh, how do we think about comparing these policies? So the policies I propose are also of different magnitudes. What's nice about the model is we're able to derive an expression that tells us what is, which policy has the biggest bang for its buck. So we're able to normalize for the actual dollar spent by the central bank. Uh, and here on the y-axis is, is our measure of sort of bang for your buck. And we can compare the interest rate cut to the asset purchases to direct lending relative to a theoretical maximum impact benchmark if you were to perfectly target those assets that are most fragile. And here we find that asset purchases are very high impact, even though they seem restrictive, but a part of that is because the short-term IG bonds are the most uh, fragile, or not the most fragile, they're, they're more fragile relative to long-term IG. The interest rate cut, the conventional monetary policy, is less effective than directly trying to intervene in the mutual fund sector. We have more um, policy uh, counterfactuals in the paper if you're interested in looking. Okay, but to uh, close, uh, what this paper does is we're developing a two-layer asset demand system to try to analyze fragility in the corporate bond market. Um, we are able to generate tractable joint dynamics of asset prices and flows um, and, and show how crisis dynamics unfold. The nice thing is that we can use simple statistics that can be estimated from micro data um, and say something about quantifying fragility in the cross section of both bonds and funds um, and hopefully uh, glean some lessons for policy design. So thank you so much. I